Joining us now from Uvalde, Texas, is MSNBC's Yasmin Vesugian. Yasmin, after today's jaw-dropping admission of failure by officials, how are people reacting there in Uvalde? Angry, frustrated, sad. I think no matter what comes out of this police department here, a local police department, federal agents as well, um, any of the new details that will emerge, um, accountability, um, admission of fault, admission that they should have gone in earlier, whatever comes after today, it won't matter. Because leading up to today, there have been so many missteps in the details that they have provided. And then now learning about this essential one hour, really, and 20 minute gap from the time at which this shooter entered that school behind me to the time to which he was neutralized. There were students inside that were alive in those classrooms, repeatedly making those phone calls, Jonathan, and, and, and you walked through it, right? 12.03 was the first phone call that came in from room 112. Uh, there were subsequent calls following that, 12.10, 12.16 from room 111 as well. There were students calling 911. The first 911 call, Jonathan, came in at 11.30, saying a mm. crash has happened near the school and there is a man that is armed. And he shot at two individuals that were working at a funeral home that ran to the crash site when they saw the truck crashing in to the ditch um, behind the school, just three blocks away from here. It took him five minutes to make his way to the school to which he started unleashing fire outside the school grounds. School resource officer, nowhere to be found. I asked at the press conference earlier today, where was the school resource officer? He was off campus, he was not here. He was driving elsewhere as he learned of the active shooter on campus, he quickly made, and this is their words, made his way to the school, bypassing the shooter who was crouching in a bush area, shooting at the school, and thought a teacher was the shooter, thought a teacher was the one who was armed as he saw that individual outside the school. It was not the teacher. He bypassed the shooter at that point. You mentioned the fact that the shooter made his way into the school um, around 11.32, I believe it was, um, followed by Seven officers, seven. 30 minutes later, 19 were inside the school. 30 minutes later, and it wasn't until 1250 that they were able to neutralize the shooter. You had Bortec, you had DHS between 12 and 1215, according to Julie Ainsley's reporting, as you mentioned, arriving on the scene and told by local police to stand down. DHS at that point was instructed to remove students from um, windowed areas, windowed classrooms. You had Vortex standing on the scene with everything, all of the tactical, um, all of the tactical materials that they need in hand to fight the shooter. And they were told to stand down for 30 minutes until they decided to override what they were being told by local officials and to neutralize the shooter. This community is up in arms. They are angry. They are sad. But here's the worst part, Jonathan. They are not surprised. And I think that's the question mm. we need to ask going forward as well is, they are not surprised by the response of local police. This community is not surprised by that because of the history they have had with this police as well. Yasmin, um, we've known each other a long time. Uh, I've never seen you like this. Um, and what you've told us this evening um, explains why. It, it, it is inexplicable, the story that we are all covering and that you are covering from the ground. Um, I am, I'm speechless. And Yasmin, I'm going to let you go before um, I'm not able to uh, go any further. It's hard. In this show. It is so hard. Um, it's bad enough to see babies killed, little children killed. But to hear the negligence of the adults they depended on for their safety um, is hard to take. And that school resource officer driving past, I, I would like to hear that person's explanation for why they weren't on their post. It's the whole point of the job, is to be there to protect those kids, and they, they weren't there. I, I, Yasmin Vesugian, uh, thank Jonathan, you. Let me, let, me, let me tell you. Yeah, sure. Let, let me tell you one more thing. Um, I spoke to the older brother of a little boy named Xavier who lost his life in room 111. Ten-year-old boy, loved to dance, loved his family. 
love to take care of his little girlfriend, Annabelle, who lost her life as well. A call came in from room 111 at 1216, a 911 call. Xavier was in room 111. His brother wonders, had they reacted, had they gone in, would Xavier be alive today? Would his girlfriend, Annabelle, be alive today? It is that personal, it is that immediate, and it is those questions that need to be answered for these families that have lost everything and lost their future. These kids, these babies that they brought into this world. Let me first get your reaction to what happened this week. You're a father. You've got two kids who aren't much younger than the kids who were tragically murdered in that school. How does that make you feel? Uh, it makes me feel terrible. And listening to Mike talk, it just brings it all back. You know, when, yeah. I, when I deployed to Afghanistan, the people who sent us there, they told us that we were there to keep terrorism at bay. They told us we were there to keep our homes, our families, and our children safe so that only terrorists would be overseas. And now those same people, because they're unwilling or unable to act in Washington, are telling me that despite those deployments, I have to come back here while my kids are doing uh, shooting drills at school. I have to come back. I have to look my six-year-old and my eight-year-old in the eye, and I have to tell them that it didn't work, that their school may become a war zone at any time. It's absolutely insane. I mean, that's an excellent point you made, Lucas, about being sent overseas to keep the terrorists over there so they don't harm us here. And we're being terrorized by mass shooting after, after mass shooting. Um, as, a, as a Marine veteran and a gun owner, what goes through your head when you hear some of the details about what the shooters— um, the, the AR-15, a literal weapon of war, he was able to get this gun and was able to do what he did to innocent children. Why would an 18-year-old need a gun like that? It's absolutely terrible. You know, when 18-year-olds join, look, we're used to 18-year-olds getting assault rifles in the Marine Corps, right? It happens every single day. And you just don't hand an 18-year-old an assault rifle and a pile of ammo and tell him to figure it out or to do whatever he wants to do with it. You make sure they go through training. You make sure they go through observation. They go through all sorts of stuff to make sure that they're able to safely handle that weapon and not do anything bad with it. It's unbelievable that we can just roll out here with, without even comprehensive background checks in this country. And, you know, you talk about what people in Missouri want. People in Missouri, they want the exact same thing that people around this country that want. Republicans, Democrats, independents, gun owners and non-gun owners. They all want comprehensive background checks, red flag laws, ways to make sure that these weapons, weapons of war, stay out of the hands of criminals and terrorists. I'm so glad we have you on tonight, Mike, because we often just get a sanitized version of what actually happens inside the schools during these types of events. But you actually spoke to a teacher who was in that school listening to those children as they screamed for their lives. Good, good Lord, Mike, T tell us what she told you. Uh, yeah, she, uh, I spoke with a teacher, uh, you know, just over 24 hours after the shooting. Uh, I stood on her front porch and she described for me hearing the gunshots um, and knowing right away what that meant and running and locking her door, getting her kids under their desks urging them to be quiet, begging them to be quiet, and then sitting on the floor in the center of the room as some of them, some of them cried and uh, just waited for what she described as the longest 35 minutes of her life as, she, as they could hear children down the hall wailing. Um, and she just told, them, told her kids to, to pray until uh, officers finally came and broke out the glass and she was able to help each of her kids out. There's nothing more painful than hearing a terrified child scream. Um, but to know that they're screaming because there's a murderer in the classroom is just, uh, it's beyond. Um, Mike, the, the, the teacher you spoke to, uh, she made sure um, to make this point before your interview ended. She told you, and I want to quote, um, I want you to say this in your article. 
our children did not deserve this. They were loved, not only by their families, but by their family at school. Mike, why was it important, so important for her to make that point? In a year when teachers across the country are being accused uh, by some of the people you just played at the NRA conference <laughs> of it, wanting to harm children by indoctrinating them, by teaching white children to hate themselves, um, in a year when teachers have become vilified, she wanted the world to know that she did everything she could to protect those kids because she loves them like they're her own kids. And she really wanted me to share that message with, with every, anyone who will listen. Uh, Mike, Mike, I have to go, but real quickly, um, how are you doing? This is not an easy story. I'm okay. I'm home. Okay. Uh, I'm back home with my, my four kids, and um, I'm going to take some time off just to, to rest and, and hug them. This isn't a one-off, you know, this happened out of the blue. This is an issue. It's a growing issue. You know, I've got six children. My children are growing up in a world much different than you and I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And we got to be aware of that. Since the Columbine massacre in 1999, there have been more than 300 school shootings across the United States. The current generation has never known school to be a completely safe place. They've grown up with school shootings, lockdown drills, and protesting school violence. And today's school kids will be tomorrow's elected officials. Joining us now is Maxwell Alejandro Frost, Democratic candidate for Congress representing Florida's 10th district. He is a former organizing director for the group March for Our Lives. Maxwell, uh, I sort of hesitate to say um, great to see you again, but we have met on my Sunday show, um, so it is good to see you. But Maxwell, a after the murder of 19 children and two teachers in Uvalde, what legislation would you push for in Congress to try to prevent these mass murders in school from happening? There's a lot of different legislation we need to pass, but we need to get something done that can make a huge difference that the majority of Americans, gun owners included, are for, and that is universal background checks. We need, you know, we saw today folks advocating and protesting in Texas, and that's the type of advocacy we need. You know, I got involved in this fight at 15 years old after Sandy Hook. It's been 10 years. People are fed up and they want to see action, and this time will be different because it has to be. Every day we lose 100 lives. So I would say universal background checks. Mm -hmm. the, the Associated Press interviewed an Ohio teacher who spoke with her sixth graders the day after the Uvalde mass murder. She told the AP, quote, some students said they were sad, some were dismayed. The 19 slain children were so young. After a few minutes, though, the conversation fizzled. Students were ready to move on with their day. Maxwell, what would you say to students who've grown up with the reality of school shootings who are seemingly numb to these tragedies? What I would say is we cannot allow ourselves to become numb. Like I said, every day we lose 100 people. And it's easy when we turn on the news and we see these tragedies every day to become numb. But recognize that behind every number, there is a beautiful human being, someone with loved ones and families and stories. And so that's why this time has to be different and why we have to continue to fight. People are tired of the violence. We deserve the right to live fear, uh, free of the fear of being gunned down. And we deserve that by virtue of being human beings. And my generation is going to make sure that this stops um, in our lifetime. And we're going to continue to fight no matter what. You know, your generation is what gives me hope, especially with the March for Our Lives. And I'm just wondering, do the protests that we saw outside the NRA convention, do they give you hope um, that maybe this time things will change? They 100 percent give me hope, Jonathan. These are folks that are mourning in the midst of this morning. They said we need to go out to demand that we need a change in our country right now. We're in a world where we can live free of gun violence. And people are here to do that work right now. It gives me an incredible amount of hope. We're going to see marches all across the country, and we're going to continue um, to ensure that we keep this fight alive and don't become numb to it. The idea that an 18-year-old kid can walk into a gun store and buy two assault weapons 
It's just wrong. 19 children and two teachers in Uvalde were killed by weapons their killer bought for his 18th birthday. According to the Giffords Law Center, only six states, Florida, Washington, Vermont, California, Illinois, and Hawaii, have increased the minimum age to purchase assault rifles from 18 to 21 years old. In a new Reuters Ipsos poll, 72 percent said they would support raising the age to buy a gun from 18 to 21. Joining us now is Democratic Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland. He's a 30-year Army veteran and the vice chair of the House Armed Services Committee. Congressman, great to see you. Let's listen to what Governor Greg Abbott had to say when asked today if he would consider imposing a ban on 18-year-olds buying assault rifles. For a century and a half, 18-year-olds could buy rifles. And we didn't have school shootings, but we do now. Maybe we're focusing our attention on the wrong thing. Congressman, your reaction to the governor? He couldn't be more wrong. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, 72 plus percent of Americans support raising the age uh, to buy a semi-automatic rifle. This is an assault weapon to 21. Already, federal law requires you to be 21 to buy a handgun. Look. I was a soldier for 30 years. I went to Iraq. I know the damage, the destruction of these semi-automatic rifles. We don't need them in our neighbors and our communities, period. That's why states like Maryland have banned them altogether. But if we can't ban assault weapons, it's certainly reasonable to raise the age to 21, the same age that we have for a handgun. We know that one in every eight mass shootings includes an 18 to 20 year old. We also know that more than 60 percent of mass shootings include assault rifles. So it only makes sense. It doesn't solve everything, but it's an important piece of the puzzle if we are going to solve this mass shooting, taking of lives, 31 in the last 10 days in Buffalo and Uvalde, both by shooters under 21, 18 years old with semi-automatic rifles. We need to be urgent and Congress has to act with a sense of urgency. But Congressman, according to the new Reuters Ipsos poll, 49 percent said they were not confident that lawmakers would strengthen gun laws this year. Only 35 percent said they were confident. After two mass shootings in 10 days, do you think anything will be different this time? Look, what I, what I think is that Congress has to come back to Washington and we need to put, do our level best to raise the age of 21 for semi-automatic rifles, assault weapons. We have to pass a red flag law, a national standard, and we have to pass universal background checks. Now, we've done the, fir the background checks and the red flag law. We've already gotten those out of the House in the past. We've got to come back. We've got to work with the Senate to make sure that they get it done. Look, am I confident? Look, if history uh, is any indication uh, of what to expect in the next few months, I'm not optimistic. But I'll tell you right now, as a public official who is elected to fight for people, to fight for safe neighborhoods, I'm going back to Washington intent, hell bent. I'm making sure I do everything I can with my colleagues to pass meaningful gun safety regulation.